This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Crandall, Fremont, California, September 2007. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 51. The Comtesse de l'Estorade to Madame Marie Gaston. 1835. What has come to you, my dear? After a silence of two years, surely René has a right to feel anxious about Louise. So this is love. It brushes aside and scatters to the winds a friendship such as ours. You must admit that, devoted as I am to my children, more even perhaps than you to your Gaston, a mother's love has something expansive about it which does not allow it to steal from other affections, or interfere with the claims of friendship. I miss your letters. I long for a sight of your dear sweet face. Oh, Louise, my heart has only conjecture to feed upon. As regards ourselves, I will try and tell you everything as briefly as possible. On reading your last letter but one, I find some stinging comments on our political situation. You mocked at us for keeping the post in the audit department, which, as well as the title of Count, Louis owed to the favor of Charles X. But I should like to know, please, how it would be possible, out of an income of forty thousand livres, thirty thousand of which go with the entail, to give a suitable start in life to Athene and my poor little beggar René. Was it not a duty to live on our salary and prudently allow the income of the estate to accumulate? In this way we shall, in twenty years, have put together about six hundred thousand francs, which will provide portions for my daughter and for René, whom I destine for the navy. The poor little chap will have an income of ten thousand livres, and perhaps we may contrive to leave him in cash enough to bring his portion up to the amount of his sister's. When he is captain, my beggar will be able to make a wealthy marriage, and take a position in society as good as his elder brother's. These considerations of prudence determined the acceptance in our family of the new order of things. The new dynasty, as was natural, raised Louis to the peerage, and made him a grand officer of the Legion of Honor. The oath once taken, Lesterade could not be half-hearted in his services, and he has since then made himself very useful in the chamber. The position he has now attained is one in which he can rest upon his oars till the end of his days. He has a good deal of adroitness in business matters, and though he can hardly be called an orator, speaks pleasantly and fluently, which is all that is necessary in politics. His shrewdness and the extent of his information in all matters of government and administration are fully appreciated, and all parties consider him indispensable. I may tell you that he was recently offered an embassy, but I would not let him accept it. I am tied to Paris by the education of Armand and Athenée, who are now respectively thirteen and nearly eleven, and I don't intend leaving till little René has completed his, which is just beginning. We could not have remained faithful to the elder branch of the dynasty, and returned to our country life without allowing the education and prospects of the three children to suffer. A mother, my sweet, is hardly called on to be a Decius, especially at a time when the type is rare. In fifteen years from now, Lesterade will be able to retire to La Crampade on a good pension, having found a place as referendary for Armand in the audit department. As for René, the Navy will doubtless make a diplomatist of him. The little rogue at seven years old has all the cunning of an old cardinal. O oh, Louise, I am indeed a happy mother. My children are an endless source of joy to me. Senza Brahma Secura Ricesa Armand is a day scholar at Henry the Fourth's school. I made up my mind he should have a public school training, yet could not reconcile myself to the thought of parting with him. So I compromised as the Duc d'Orleans did before he became, or in order that he might become, Louis-Philippe. Every morning, Lucas, the old servant whom you will remember, takes Armand to school in time for the first lesson, and brings him home again at half-past four. In the house we have a private tutor, an admirable scholar, who helps Armand with his work in the evenings, and calls him in the morning at the school hour. Lucas takes him some lunch during the play-hour at midday, in this way I am with my boy at dinner and until he goes to bed at night, and I see him off in the morning. Armand is the same charming little fellow, full of feeling and unselfish impulse whom you loved, and his tutor is quite pleased with him. 
I still have Nais and the baby, two restless little mortals, but I am quite as much a child as they are. I could not bring myself to lose the darling's sweet caresses. I could not live without the feeling that at any moment I can fly to Armand's bedside and watch his slumbers or snatch a kiss. Yet home education is not without its drawbacks, to which I am fully alive. Society, like nature, is a jealous power, and will not have her rights encroached on or her system set at naught. Thus, children who are brought up at home are exposed too early to the fire of the world. They see its passions and become at home with its subterfuges. The finer distinctions, which regulate the conduct of matured men and women, elude their perceptions, and they take feeling and passion for their guide instead of subordinating those to the code of society. Whilst the gay trappings and tinsel which attract so much of the world's favor blind them to the importance of the more sober virtues. A child of fifteen, with the assurance of a man of the world, is a thing against all nature. At twenty-five he will be prematurely old, and his precocious knowledge only unfits him for the genuine study on which all solid ability must rest. Life in society is one long comedy, and those who take part in it, like other actors, reflect back impressions which never penetrate below the surface. A mother, therefore, who wishes not to part from her children, must resolutely determine that they shall not enter the gay world. She must have courage to resist their inclinations, as well as her own, and keep them in the background. Cornelia had to keep her jewels under lock and key. Shall I do less for the children who are all the world to me? Now that I am thirty, the heat of the day is over. The hardest bit of the road lies behind me. In a few years I shall be an old woman, and the sense of duty done is an immense encouragement. It would almost seem as though my trio can read my thoughts and shape themselves accordingly. A mysterious bond of sympathy unites me to these children who have never left my side. If they knew the blank in my life which they have to fill, they could not be more lavish of the solace they bring. Armand, who was dull and dreamy during his first three years at school, and caused me some uneasiness, has made a sudden start. Doubtless he realized, in a way most children never do, the aim of all this preparatory work, which is to sharpen the intelligence, to get them into habits of application, and accustom them to that fundamental principle of all society, obedience. My dear, a few days ago I had the proud joy of seeing Armand crowned at the great interscholastic competition in the crowded Sorbonne, when your godson received the first prize for translation. At the school distribution he got two first prizes, one for verse and one for an essay. I went quite white when his name was called out, and longed to shout aloud, I am his mother. Little Nais squeezed my hand till it hurt, if at such a moment it were possible to feel pain. Ah, Louise, a day like this might outweigh many a dream of love. His brother's triumphs have spurred on little Renée, who wants to go to school, too. Sometimes the three children make such a racket, shouting and rushing about the house, that I wonder how my head stands it. I am always with them. No one else, not even Mary, is allowed to take care of my children. But the calling of a mother, if taxing, has so many compensating joys. To see a child leave its play and run to hug one out of the fullness of its heart, what could be sweeter? Then it is only being constantly with them that one can study their characters. It is the duty of a mother, and one which she can depute to no higher teacher, to decipher the taste, temper, and natural aptitudes of her children from their infancy. All home-bred children are distinguished by ease of manner and tact, two acquired qualities which may go far to supply the lack of natural ability, whereas no natural ability can atone for the loss of this early training. I have already learned to discriminate this difference of tone in the men whom I meet in society, and to trace the hand of a woman in the formation of a young man's manners. How could any woman defraud her children of such a possession? You see what rewards attend the performance of my tasks. Armand, I feel certain, will make an admirable judge, the most upright of public servants, the most devoted of deputies. And where would you find a sailor bolder, more adventurous, more astute, than my René will be a few years hence? The little rascal has already an iron will. Whatever he wants, he manages to get. He will try a thousand circuitous ways to reach his end, and, if not successful then, will devise a thousand and first. Where dear Armand quietly resigns himself and tries to get at the reason of things, René will storm and strive and puzzle, 
chattering all the time, till at last he finds some chink in the obstacle. If there is room for the blade of a knife to pass, his little carriage will ride through in triumph. And Nais? Nais is so completely a second self that I can hardly realize her as distinct from my own flesh and blood. What a darling she is, and how I love to make a little lady of her, to dress her curly hair, tender thoughts mingling the while with every touch. I must have her happy. I shall only give her to the man who loves her, and whom she loves. But heavens, when I let her put on her little ornaments, or pass a cherry-colored ribbon through her hair, or fasten the shoes on her tiny feet, a sickening thought comes over me. How can one order the destiny of a girl? Who can say that she will not love a scoundrel or some man who is indifferent to her? Tears often spring to my eyes as I watch her. This lovely creature, this flower, this rosebud which has blossomed in one's heart, to be handed over to a man who will tear it from the stem and leave it bare. Louise, it is you, you who in two years have not written three words to tell me of your welfare. It is you who have recalled to my mind the terrible possibilities of marriage, so full of anguish for a mother wrapped up, as I am, in her child. Farewell now, for in truth you don't deserve my friendship, and I hardly know how to write. Oh, answer me, dear Louise. End of letter 51